How about that? Hey, on. Wow. I'm back there looking at them like, turn these on, and it's, it was unplugged. Anyway, so that was just an illustration for today. Um, <laughs> no. Yes, that's, is there an armor in that? that is, that's in the message version of, like, plug in to, no, okay, we'll, we'll go on. I'll try to salvage what I'm going to talk about here today. But how many of you, um, when you were little, like, pulled the covers over your head when something was happening? Like, like, you were afraid of the ghost, you were afraid of the monster, you were afraid of the person that was in your room. For whatever reason, he's in there, nobody else in the house knew, but that person was in your room, you know, like, you were afraid of that, and, and your way to get away from him was to cover up. Did anybody do that when you were little? Like, if you cover up, they, the monster can't get you if you have covers over your head. Yeah. How many of you still do that, you know, now? Does anyone still do it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're in a safe place. No. Or how many, maybe this is more real, is how many you do that, like, if your parents, like, too high from your kids. <laughs> if I, they don't see me, they'll go back to bed or something. We used to do, yeah, I do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it's not like spouses and we're like, we're talking trouble here. But no, no, it's like, you think, I think about this with that. And one of the greatest tactics that I think Satan will do, and we said this throughout the series, is if he can convince us, the church, Christians, that there's nothing going on, that there's no reason we should even be talking about this, that there is no spiritual battle going on, then he's won. If he can convince us of that, if he can convince, or, or if he can just get us distracted, you guys, we can be distracted by good things, things that are okay, and we can be distracted not even in God's will, not even doing what he wants, being distracted by actual good things that aren't bad in themselves, or we can be distracted by all those stuff. He can do that. I think that's even one of his tactics is to distract us in that way, to distract us from doing all these other things or to, to get us away from God, to get us away from following His will. That's what He does. And I think the results you get of that is what's happening many times in churches is there's, there's inactivity, there's passivity, there's, there's unholy contentment. You know, it's just we're not really doing what God wants. We think we're okay, we're fine. I'm okay as long as I don't know what's going on around me. It's almost like we're pulling the covers over our head and saying, there's nothing really happening out there. I don't want to know about all this stuff. And we think we're okay. And I think Satan is one when he does that. That's part of his scheme. That's what we're saying in this battle that we got to understand. That's part of his scheme, what he's doing there. So what I said, we'll put this up here, the first point. I've been saying this throughout this series. There is a battle and we are in it. That's just what we got to start off here from the very beginning is there is a spiritual battle. There is a battle going on. And, and us as the church, Christians, we have to understand this, that there is a battle and we are actually in this. So let's go into Ephesians chapter 6, where we've been. And we'll start in verse 10, how we've always been doing this and kind of building this this case for all this armor. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that, when the, uh, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand. You may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then today, take the helmet of salvation. And I just kind of stopped in mid-sentence like, here on that. But that's what we're going to be talking about here today is taking up the helmet of salvation. So I'm not going to go back in this, but I was doing my reading this week. And if you just kind of go back in Ephesians and, and you, you see this case really that Paul is making, he goes, starts in verse, chapter 4 of really just kind of building this, this armor case. And he goes in there and he talks about unity, like there needs to be unity in the church. And, and why? Well, why is there need to be unity in the church? Because this unity caused so many problems. And maybe you've seen that. Satan wants more than anything to just cause disunity. He wants us to be fighting. He wants there to be trouble. He wants us, he wants our handshaking time to be super awkward. You know, he wants us to not like want to be around each other. He wants it to just be crazy and weird and disunity. He wants us to talk about each other. He wants us to gossip. He wants us to just have all these problems. And all of that will destroy churches. It will destroy what God is wanting us to have in this family. And that has to stop. That is something that we have to strive. And I strive for all the time. It's like, if there is any of that going on, I try to hit to it. I'm not the most perfect, but it's like, we have to stop all that. Unity is so important. And he wants us to have it. And there's, there's problems in that. He wants us to separate. He wants us to 
divide over stupid things. I've seen churches divide over like, you know, we talk about color of carpet or, or you know, the look of a building. Like this is just a building here. I'm just, I'm super thankful that we have this building, but this is just a building. It's just, it's just, it's cool that we get to come here and we get to have a place and we don't have to think from week to week, like where are we going to be at? But this is just a building. We're the church. We have to understand that. He, we got to be united on that front. We have to understand that. So he talks about that. And he goes in, you know, he, he goes in from that case and he's talking about Christians, how we should live, how, what it means to be a Christian and how we should live in this world. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Sometimes it's convicting things. You know, he's talking about it. It's so important. And he goes into Christian households, talks about the husband, the wife, kids, and how the, that should be, building on that case. And he comes to this part here in chapter six of putting on the armor of God. Like all of this is important for us. All of this is important for us. We have to understand this. We have to follow God and, and, and see why he's telling us to put on this armor and take his advice and do these things and actually take these steps and follow his will because he knows what he's talking about. Otherwise, we're going to be open for attack. We're going to be vulnerable and we've talked about that. We're going to be open for these attacks and these arrows coming at us and the, just the, the picture we, we've looked at with those fiery darts and those fiery arrows coming at us and it hits and that sin happens and it just spreads in our lives and that's what happens. Our lives get messed up. Churches separate, people separate, families separate, people want to go away from God. All of that happens from sin. So he's saying, I want you guys to be protected in this battle. So I want to talk about today, that's kind of building up to what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, just, just this piece of armor we're going to be looking at today. But before I look in Ephesians, I, I want to read this verse from the Old Testament. This is Isaiah 59, 17. And I'm just referencing this. I'm just going to look at it. But Isaiah 59, 17, this is looking at God. This is in the Old Testament, and I love this picture. It says, he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. Now, I so said this is from the Old Testament, and this is looking at God. This is referring to the Israelites. The Israelites were once again in slavery. They had messed up. They were with God. They started serving other gods, and they, they would go away, and he would allow them to be taken over by other nations. And this happened all the time. Then they would cry out to him, come back to him. He would take them in. It's just how he is. He's graceful in that way, but he's not going to allow us to, to go on uh, sinning against him and, and away from him. He's going to allow that to happen. And so he would allow these nations to come in. And so this is a picture of it. And you see this picture of, of God being this, this warrior, putting on this armor. And, and I love that picture. Like he's just, he's, he's just there. It's just this really cool picture of him just, just being this conquering warrior. This, he's the victor. He's putting this on this breastplate of righteousness, this helmet of salvation. But this is a little different from what it's talking about here in Ephesians. This is talking about God here in this way. And think about it like this. I have this point up here. God's helmet of salvation, this is kind of a long point here. My points today are really long, but I, I want us to get these things here. God's helmet of salvation is his own purpose. Man's helmet of salvation is God's gift to us. So this isn't exactly the same picture that we see here from the Old Testament here. We're, we just finished up in our home group going through Jonah, a really short chapter, you know, we know the fish swallows Jonah, you know, he messes up. So you see that Jonah was inside this, this huge fish and he's crying out to God, which all of us are like, that's exactly what I would have done if I was swallowed by this enormous fish. That's what else are you going to do in there? You know, he's, he cries out to God and, and he cries out saying that the salvation belongs to God. And then look at this, Re Revelation 17, I have this up here. This is John describing this, the great multitude in heaven. And they said really the same thing. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Salvation belongs to God. Jonah was crying out to God, salvation belongs to the Lord. It, it belongs to him. So I want us to understand that. Salvation is right here, and we see this in the Old Testament. This wasn't, this wasn't God needing salvation. That, that's a totally different picture. That He doesn't need that. He's, he, he's, he's doing this for our benefit. He, he's doing that for us. Like, we need this. He's taking this up so, so that, that we can come to him now and have salvation. So it's a different picture that we see in that. We see that with that helmet of salvation. I, I think a better way really to look at this, and it, rather than saying like take it up, I'm not changing scripture, but I'm just saying like as we interpret this, as we look at it, it's like us receiving that salvation from him. We, we go to him. It's not us in any way. Well, we don't earn it in any way. There's nothing you and I can do to earn this salvation. None of us has anything good in what we do. We, we just, we can't. We don't have a great portfolio. We don't have this great resume. None of us are good enough. We are incapable. It's not just good enough. We are incapable of earning salvation. So this is the idea of like 
receiving that from him. It's there, it's for us, but we just, we just come to him and, and we receive that. What an amazing thing. That, that is grace. That, that is God's grace and his sovereignty coming to us when we were against him, when we were his enemy. And so that's the picture of this, that, that we really receive that. So regardless of, uh, of really how you look at salvation, how we get this, none of us could get it unless God first came to us and, and made a way for us. But I, I just, I wanted to put that picture in there of just seeing God this conquering warrior, and he did this. He did this stuff so that we could come to him, so that we could have this way of having salvation. Here's another way to say it, another long point. It's really like a paragraph. God is strong to save because he wills to save. We are strong and safe when we take the salvation which he gives to us. And I want us to understand that. Like, it comes from him. All this, this salvation, this ability comes from him. And, and we are safe when we actually come to him. The salvation is not on our part whatsoever. In fact, follow along with me. This is in, still in the same book, but Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which, you used, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, <clears throat> God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And I, I could go on. I just picked a spot to stop in that chapter. Because it goes on in verses 8 and 9. The, the verses we know, it's by grace you are saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. That's the point. So, so we can't come to this and be like, look at what I've done. This is, this is why I deserve to be in heaven. This is how great I am. It's like n none of us. We have, we have no standing there to, to say, look, this is what I've done. This is why I deserve salvation. That's what he says. So church, Christians, people, our, our, our pride, your pride, my pride, all of our pride should just be absolutely crushed at the throne of grace. We, there, there's no place for pride in any of us. We, don't, we shouldn't have it. There's, there's no place in it. It doesn't matter. You, you haven't done anything to deserve it. So our, our pride is crushed at the throne of grace and what he's done for us. We've got to understand that. I think that's so important for us to come to this and to be able to come to God in, in, in salvation. But write this down. I, I think this is important when we think about the helmet of salvation, how we receive this, and it's so undeserved. Write, write this down. The more assured of your salvation, the more defended you'll be. And I'll explain what I'm talking about. I'm thinking about this spiritual battle. And I'm thinking about this helmet of salvation. The more assured of your salvation, the more defended you'll be in this. The worldwide church, there's, there's differing views on salvation and assurance of that. I'm not going to be going into some theology lesson on that. that. That's for a different time. We can talk about that. That's not what I really want to get into here. And it doesn't really matter for what I'm saying here. But, but hear me on this. The, the more we realize, the more we are assured and have this confidence that God has done this amazing saving work in our life, the, the more we understand how he's done something to us that, that we don't deserve at all. The, the, the more we understand that he, he's, he's brought us from death to life. Like, like you really get that. Like when you don't have Christ, let me just paint this for you if you're not really following me. If you don't have Christ, it's not a good picture. We, we are on the way to hell. That's what he says. When you come to know him, it brings you from death to life. Like we are saved. And that's the picture that he's saying. That when we start to get that, when we understand that, and we see, man, I didn't deserve this in any possible way. It, it changes us. The, the, the more we're, we're, we're protected, I think when we understand that. We're protecting this. How many of us, you, know, you don't have to raise your hand on this or whatever. There's been times, I know, I think early on in ministry, I was this place like, have you ever questioned even your salvation? Have you ever been there? And it's like, you know what? Like, if you ever just, sometimes you can just sit and like be your own worst enemy if you sit with your thoughts too long. You're just thinking about this. Like, this doesn't make sense. This is really hard to understand. Why would he do this? And, and sometimes I think we, we let our minds really go too far. And I think a lot of people, question. I've been in ministry a lot. A lot of people have questioned their salvation. And they're wondering about that. I think Satan wants nothing more than for us to be in that place. He wants us to be questioning our salvation. He does not want us to have any type of assurance. He wants us to be in fear. This is what it does when we do that. When we're questioning that all the time, it's, it keeps us from, from following God. It keeps, well, we're doubting, so we, we question his love for us. And then you start having all these thoughts. Well, I'm not good enough, which we're not. Uh, I, there's no way I deserve this, which we don't. You know, and we start thinking about all this stuff, and it's like, there's no way. There's no way he loves me. He can't possibly love me. This is what I've done. And, and, and we just get lost in our thoughts there. And what 
what happens there is we get, we get idle in following him. We, we have no hope. We have no joy. We have no happiness. We, many times we just don't want to do his work. We don't want to follow him. And we stay back and we do nothing. And I think that's what happens when we're in that. We have this fear and worry, and he wants us to stay in those places. I think he wants us to do that. So we're, we're protected when we come to know him, we have that type of assurance because we're not distracted by our fear. We're not distracted by our worry. We're not distracted by our second guessing. Is he really with me? Can he possibly love me? We're not distracted by those things. When we come to know him and when we see that, that, that passion and, and that love for us and that he, he has saved us and, and we have that assurance, it keeps us from those places where we back away and many times can lead us to disobedience and just idleness from really following him. I think when we understand that, that he's really there for us. So Paul draws this image. You know, he's really just talking, he says, therefore, like thinking about the spiritual battle, this is part of that battle. Therefore, because of all this, put on this armor. Therefore, because these things are going to happen to you. Therefore, when the enemy's going to come at you. He's going to throw these attacks at you. He, he's going to try to come for your salvation. He's going to try to come for you. He's going to come for your mind. And he's going to try to talk you out of this. He's going to try to say, you don't deserve this. God doesn't possibly love you. Look at all these people. They're doing way better than you. And he's going to try to convince you of that. And he's going to try to pull you back from doing anything. And he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, he says, I want you to be able to stand. I want you to be able to stand through all of these attacks. This is part of this battle. And Paul draws this image of this ideal warrior. I love it. It's just this fully equipped warrior with all this battle gear on and he's ready. And he talks about it. It's just, we've been going through it, all these specific pieces. And it's just so important for us not to just take one piece and leave one piece off, like to put all of this stuff on. And, and here's what I think it does is like, it gives us this tremendous hope later on. When we know we have this salvation, you put on this helmet of salvation, it does. It gives us a tremendous hope knowing like, you know what? I'll just say it's like, if you put your faith in Christ, if you truly follow him, you have faith in him, you are saved. And what God's word says to us and what he says to us, he doesn't lie, is like, we're going to be in heaven one day. That is a literal fact. We are going to be in heaven in this paradise of all paradises. Like, that is amazing. That, that is an amazing hope. So we have that. That is great. But I think it does even more than that. Like this helmet of salvation, like, like trusting in him and being saved, it does more than just give us hope for later on after we die. But I think it even does stuff for us in this life. It gives us confidence, not in ourselves. I've already said that. We should crush that. But it gives us confidence to live and to be able to stand in this life, to be able to follow him with everything. I think that's what it does. It, it gives us power to go against these temptations and these struggles that Satan is going to throw at us. And he does it all the time. Let me close with these, uh, all these verses. I, I put a bunch of them in here. This is from a Romans chapter 8. But I want to give us encouragement in this and just reading this. And if you are a follower of Christ, this is the hope you have. And it, really, I could just read the whole chapter of Romans 8. But I'm going to read a couple of big sections of it. And then I just want to kind of come to the end there. But Romans 8, 1 through 4, I'll read that right here. Therefore, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So it's just like there's no condemnation in us. If, you're, if we're in Christ, it wasn't us. It was Him. And now we're, we're covered because of what Christ did. And there's so much in there. But I just, I, I jumped down just for the sake of time, which I shouldn't even worry about that at all. But Romans 8, 31 through 38. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
if you have faith in Christ, this is the hope that you have. I, I want to encourage you guys with that. If, this is, if you have faith in Christ, this is the hope that you have. This is real. And sometimes, I, I, I don't know, I look at my life, and maybe, it's, maybe not everybody's there, but sometimes I look at my life and I'm like, man, do I really believe this? Because if I really did believe this, I, I think I would be doing more. I, I think I would be serving God more. I, I don't think some things in this life would bother me as much if I really did believe this. And I just want to throw that out there to you guys. That's convicting to me, and I do. I want to convict you guys in that way. It's like, if we really do believe this, we think this is the hope we have. And, and this isn't just something I'm just reading up here and doesn't mean anything. If we really believe this, it, it should change us. It, it should affect the way that we live. And that's what I want you guys to do. I want this to affect you. And this is the hope that you have in this life. And, and these, the, these attacks, this is the spiritual battle. These attacks are going to come at you and Satan is going to try to throw these things away. He's going to push them out of there. He's going to say, yeah, but it's different for you. He's going to try to make you quit. He's going to come at you with these attacks and say, you're not good enough. You should just quit. He's going to try to get you to question everything. He's going to try to get you to question everything that God is asking you to do because it's, it's tough because it's getting out of your comfort zones. But I'm telling you, we have to go back to his word. We have to go back to God's word. We have to believe this stuff. We have to read this and say, do I believe this from God who doesn't lie, who came to this, Jesus came in this life and he died for me Am I going to believe this or am I going to believe Satan who's been a liar from the very beginning and wants to do nothing but destroy me? And, and that seems like an obvious answer, but yet why do we always go back to him? Why do we still believe him when, when we see this and, and we can trust in God? I'm just, I want us to understand that. I want us to think about that, what he's trying to do to us. I don't want us to have these questions about our salvations. I think it happens sometimes. I think I think it can do things. I, I think it can push you sometimes to go deeper into the Word and check out your salvation. We should be. We should be going deeper. We should be looking into this and, 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 and reading into this and, and going deeper in our faith with God. He wants us to do it. He wants us to be stronger so we can read passages like these and understand. But, but look, it, it's not always going to be a high day. You're not always going to have these, these great emotional happy feelings. Sometimes it's just going to be a bad day. Sometimes you, know, you just don't feel like living the way that God wants. Sometimes it's just not a super awesome, you know, epic, I don't know, jazz hands day or whatever. Sometimes it's just not a great day. And sometimes it's just a, a regular day. And, and, and you want to go back to these days that really felt good. But I'm telling you, it's not always about these emotions. Go back to his word and see. He promises this. He says, if you trust in me, I will save you. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be safe. It's not by works so that no one can boast, right? He tells us this. Come to him. And I want you guys to understand that. Remember, the victory is already accomplished. When we consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ, it changes everything. It, it should change. It should change the way we live. It should change the way we make decisions. It should, uh, it should slam the door on, on all these opportunities for sin that are out there. When, when you say, you know what, I am dead to sin. I'm now alive in Christ. And, and not just slam the door shut on sins and these opportunities and put a lock on it, but like put a wall up there. That, it should do that when we, when we fully understand really what he's done for us. And that's what I want it to happen to us, guys. This helmet of salvation that he's given us, this is part of the battle that we, we have to understand. It is for later. It's like we're going to be saved, but I think it affects us now. It affects us now because I, I think it gives us confidence, like I said, not ourselves, but to walk in this life with assurance. This, this passion, this, this unshakable courage that doesn't come from ourselves, but this unshakable courage that comes from God, you know, that knowing that He is with you, that one day you're going to be there with Him. I, I try to tell myself that all the time. It's like one day I, I literally am going to be up there with God in heaven in this place that I can't even begin to imagine and describe now. I'm going to be there with him. And it's like, so I have this short time here on this earth, and I want to live every second of it completely devoted to him. Do I always do that? No. I'm not even going to sit up here and be a hypocrite and say I'm perfect in this way. I, this is a work in progress. I'm just telling you guys. But I'm trying to do that. I, I, I know I'm going to be there with him, but it's like, you know what? This confidence he gives me, this helmet of salvation, it's like he has saved me, and I don't deserve this. And I want to live every day, like, boldly for him. Because it's not me doing this. It's not you doing it. He is there with you. He's, he's going to allow you to do these things. So when he asks you to do something that's uncomfortable, when he's telling you, I, I want you to step out there in this world. I want you to do something that is different. Maybe it's still with your job and your life or whatever, but I want you to do something that's different. It's out of your comfort zone. I want you to do something for me. You're not doing it alone. He is there with you. And just think about that, that confident assurance, that passion that he gives you, that drive, and just follow him, knowing that he is with you. He is your conquering king. He's the victor. He's done it all. He has defeated Satan, sin and death. All that stuff is lies. It is over. It, 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 is, it has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. You're on his side now. 
He's conquered all that. He's conquered the sin and death that was in your life. And I want you guys to just walk out of here boldly and confidently and passionately about that, knowing he is with us. The world needs to see that. The world needs us as a church believing this stuff and then stepping out there. Not just talking about it. Not just getting a lot of people here and then we go out there and we live the same way. We, we have to, this has to change the way we live. When we step out of here, we got to do that. We need to hold each other accountable in that way. You guys, I just, I'm passionate about this and I want us to be. You guys, go ahead and bow your heads.